Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the in dark. dark. Weird Tales of the Woods, Volume 1, Story 1. In the late 60s, when I was a boy of 14, my buddy Bill and I frequently explored the woods in our area. They were not too deep, maybe a few miles wide by a dozen long, and all in steep windy hills. There was a folklore legend of a hostile, crazy man living in the woods nicknamed Hunky John, who lived near Hidden Lake, and would shoot buckshot at anyone coming near him. We had never seen any sign of him or Hidden Lake, although we really don't know the woods all that well. One day we came upon some coal tailings, followed them uphill, and found one of the few coal mines still existing in the area that hadn't been sealed shut. Well, being 14, our own secret coal mine was the coolest thing imaginable. We rounded up some couple of our friends, found some candles, footed our way back through the woods, and went in. The ceiling was only about five feet tall and supported by rotted, moss-covered crossbeams at the entrance, but since we still weren't fully grown, we didn't consider it a major inconvenience. The mine went back about 40 feet, around a curved wall then slimy looking water blocked our path. The water was only about 18 inches deep. We couldn't see around the bend without getting wet and neither was swine to step into the slimy water. We did notice that the wicks and smoke of our candles showed a slight steady breeze going into the mine so we knew there had to be another opening somewhere else. I was nearest the entrance when it happened. The gnarled head of an angry old man poked into the mine and began screaming obscenities at us. We were trapped in the mine with Hunky John at the entrance. Since we had nowhere to run, and the bulk of his ranting was orders to get out of his mine, we gulped and hurriedly worked our way past him. We walked as fast as we could down the coal tailings without actually running, probably because we were afraid he'd shoot us in the back if we ran. Years later, in our early 20s, we heard a rumor that his shack had been burnt down. It was late fall, and we approached the general area of the mine from uphill. We saw a burnt-out shack below at the same elevation as the mine. Approaching cautiously, it soon became apparent that nobody was around. We rifled through the burnt remains of the shack and found some rusted old hand tools, a coal stove, a medium-sized jar of black powder, an old ledger, and an ancient map. A small secluded pond, was this the so-called hidden lake, was visible a short distance from the shack. Keeping the map ledger and black powder we left with our loot. The map showed the general area around where we lived, although 90% of the roads weren't on the map. Some streets shown on the map were places we knew no road existed at all, and many of the streets we recognized had different names. I wish I hadn't lost that map over the years. In the ledger we found a few brief numerical entries and the name John Rorak. Apparently, that was the name of the infamously feared troll of the woods. I'm guessing that John Rorak was born in the late 1800s and worked in the coal mines until they were abandoned during the Great Depression. Unable to find work, he lived in the abandoned mine shacks, fished the pond, and hunted the woods for food. Undoubtedly kept himself warm in winter digging chucks of coal from the mine and became the feared mythical Hunky John. Story number two. In the early 90s, I was working late in an unfamiliar area near the foothills of the Southern California mountains. It was well past 11 p.m. Unlike the metro, this area is sparsely populated and very dark at night. You can actually see stars that the city lights would otherwise flood out. I drove back to the freeway on ramp with no streets light nearby, no light posts. The only illumination were from the stars and my headlights. As I entered the on-ramp, I could make out what appeared to be a torso up ahead on the road, in the middle of the road. This was the only on-ramp for miles, so I had no choice but to use this road. As I approached it, it certainly did appear that a human torso was in the middle of the road, like someone had chopped a man off at the waist and placed his body right in the middle of the road, or that someone had buried a man up to his waist. I slowed my speed to get a good look at the surrounding but didn't want to go too slow else someone would take a shot at me or my tires. There were no nails, boards, 
or other items on the road that could damage my tires. No bushes on the side that could hide someone lurking or a group of cutthroats that would jump out and block my car. Nothing to hide another vehicle that could dash out and block my path. So I proceeded slowly towards this human torso that by now I could make out was a male, medium thin build. I flashed my lights at it. I didn't move. I moved closer toward it with my lights directly on it. I flashed my high beams, but no response. The infamous I-5 killer did this thing on a county road and was never caught. Different scenarios crossed my mind. Could someone have killed a person and placed their chopped off torso in the middle of a road as a warning? A taunt? A final gruesome act of revenge? Was this a person very much alive and well, but just without legs due to amputation or a birth defect? Is this person even alive? Cell phones were rare in those days and would have been useless since the area was too remote for reception. My vehicle was still moving towards it at irregular speed to throw off any potential snipers. Getting closer for sure was definitely not a mannequin. It was human. I flashed my lights again for the final time before I sped up and drove past it. Still no movement. Now, as I was getting closer, my speed picked up. I planned to swerve and perhaps drive back for help or investigate if necessary. One thing I was not going to do was stop, get out of my car in the middle of nowhere. By the time I was 20 yards away, I honked my horn and this thing slowly got up. It's now about six feet tall, very alive and male. I proceeded with my plan since nothing else unusual happened besides this thing standing up. As I swerved and drove past it, it held out a thumb. I turned to quickly ID it and then look back onto the road. As I passed him, I realized that this fool was hitching a ride by sitting in a deep crevice in the middle of the road. He didn't move when I shined my headlights or honked at him. He could have easily been run over. I did not stop to lecture him or help him out. Sometimes you can't fix stupid. Besides, it could still be an ambush, a setup. I continued onward, picking up speed as I entered the freeway, both angry and grateful. Angry that someone could be so foolish in a public danger. Grateful that nothing actually happened, like me running him over. These are two stories of scary encounters that happened to me. When we used to live in Nebraska, my family used to go on vacation in a country home. When I was seven or eight years old, I heard something in my sleep because I woke up to a noise coming from the living room. I got up and went to investigate. The hallway had some small night lights to help me find the bathroom in the dark. What I saw standing by our canary cages was about eight feet tall and covered with brown hair, almost like it was wearing a ghillie. I could tell it was quietly examining the birds by the window. When it saw me, it turned to face me. It seemed to raise two long arms and sort of start creeping towards me with slow and graceful steps. It made no noise as it approached. Fear gripped me and I tried to scream but couldn't until I ran away. When I did, the screaming was able to wake everyone up in the house. My parents freaked out and checked everywhere. No sign of it was found. The back door was left unlocked overnight, accidentally, so they thought that either it was a burglar or bad dream. It did not look human though, so I still can explain what I saw. The second story was an unexplainable scare when we were guiding a dozen of 11 to 13 year old boys scouts through the Georgia mountains close to Clayton and the Chattahoochee Natural Forest. After reaching our destination, we turned to head back to camp when the weather started to turn sour. The trail went back into the bed of a dry creek, so I was worried that if it rained, we would have to head for higher ground to avoid getting washed out. All was well, and we were making good time when I noticed that the normal forest noises were completely silent. I heard something in the brush about 20 yards up the hill from us. We felt something was stalking us, and we made a pause for a head count, paired everyone up, and told everyone to stay within visual distance of each other. In this vegetation, that meant that we would have to go more slowly now, with the other scoutmaster at the head of the line and me at the very end. Whatever it was followed us for about 100 to 150 yards before leaving us. I think it was a mountain lion, but even today, I'm still not sure about that. Next story. 
this is happening in my home and my dad's been complaining to me about odd things going on in the house. This is not too long ago. One of the things that happened was when he was in the shower. He said he heard the back door open, someone walk in and whistle a tune. He thought it was just my uncle messing with him until he got out of the shower and found no one home and the house locked up. He also shared with me that he'd been hearing what he thought were conversations in the house. I didn't tell him, but at that time, I had heard them too. Nothing really loud, just sounds like two people mumbling in the background. Now, here's what kind of spooked me. My dad seemed real freaked out, as when I asked him what had scared him, but the man wouldn't tell me. Now, one day, he had my uncle and my cousin come over. They come over a lot, so I really didn't think much of this. We were all just sitting around in my basement talking and having a good time when my dad asked if I would mind leaving the room for a bit. I didn't think much of it really and retreated to the den for a bit to watch some TV. Well, after a while, I got bored and went back into the basement. Everyone seemed to be in deep conversation when I walked in. I could tell my dad was about to ask me to leave again, but he surprised me and said stay. Then he asked me something kind of odd. He asked if I had any weird feelings lately. I knew what he was getting at, so I just asked if he meant anything evil or not right in the house. He told me, yeah, that's what he meant. Apparently, he asked my uncle and cousin to come over to see if they felt anything. So I'm guessing something really had him spooked. Now, none of us really felt anything, and we all pretty much know what we're looking for when it comes to stuff like that. But still, there's no doubt that there's something or someone trying to stick around in our house. We just can't figure it out who it is or why. Here's another story. Believe it or not, it's up to you. And this one involves my uncle from the previous story. There's uh, parts of Tennessee recently went through horrible flooding. This happened to my uncle just a few days before the flooding started. He lives very close to one of the large rivers. He said a few days before the floods, he was just relaxing outside his house near sunset. He said he looked into the air and saw what he thought was a huge bird of some kind. He said it moved really odd and then the thing just vanished. Now, he didn't put any of this together until a month or two after the flooding. He started reading up on the Mothman sightings over what happened before disasters and stuff like that. Apparently, what he saw matches a lot of the descriptions of the Mothman. Now, I myself still don't know what to think of the story. The only thing I do know is that he's not a liar and I believe him. Next story. This didn't happen to me directly, mostly to my friend who I was with at the time. When we were about 14, we used to go camping a lot at each other's house. It was summertime and we were at his place in Farmersville, Texas. We had a nice spot for summer camping up on a hill under a bunch of pecan trees and it usually had a breeze blowing. We went up and set up our camp, which was only a mattress on the ground, not tents for us. It was too hot and a couple of lawn chairs. Across the fence from our spot, there was this old house. I mean, really old. And we decided to take our pellet guns and see if we might find some rats or something to shoot. So we walked over and went inside looking around. And all the walls were covered in old newspapers and such. We weren't there long because both of us were kind of creeped out by the place and left. We decided to go to the house and get some supper at the cafe. That's what we called his grandma's house. She sure was a good cook. After all that was done, it was getting close to dark, so we made our way back to the campsite, and that's when it got hairy. When we pulled up and started looking around, we noticed a big limb had fallen out of a tree, I guess, and completely flattened his chair. Mine was sitting less than a foot away and was untouched, not even a leaf in it. The bed was the same way. A big limb on his side, nothing on mine. We decided to clear everything off and sat around talking about how strange it was that my stuff was untouched. And then finally we went to sleep. It was about midnight or so when we started hearing a faint whistling sound. One tone and it was getting louder and seemed to be getting closer and coming from the direction of that house. That deserted one? We started thinking, oh Lord, we must have woken something up in there and it's coming to get us. I don't remember how fast we got back to the house, but it was quick. The next morning, we are woken up by his dad and he was wondering why we were at the house, so we told him it was just too hot. So he said, since you're all up and we're hauling hay today, it was somewhere around our third load when we noticed smoke coming from our campsite. 
but it wasn't. It was that old house was fully engulfed in flames. We were questioned about it by the fire department because our camp was still there, but we hadn't been around and had no fires of any kind. He had a few other stories about some big thing, big and hairy, standing outside our tent at my place. I had a big chow dog that went everywhere with me and he slept with us. It never woke him or me up, but he swears that something was out there. He said that happened on two different occasions. Next story. When I was 12 or so, many, many years ago, my family was camping in central Wyoming. Me, my pop, and my two younger sisters set up camp amongst the sagebrush. We were sitting around a nice campfire as the sun was setting below the mountains to the west. It kept getting dark and my sister commented on the blackbirds she kept seeing. Pop told her that they were bats, and bats they were, hundreds of them, feeding and flickering in and out of the camp light fire. Really neat, not creepy in the least. So it's almost completely dark now and you couldn't really see the bats anymore. Didn't know if they'd moved off or if the light of the fire alone wasn't enough to illuminate their activity. But what you could see was a very found outline of the horizon. Now my father began to recount some old Indian stories about various this and that and eventually told us the plain Indians had a fear of the little people. Supposedly, there were these little people who lived in the area. The Indians believed that they were their own independent tribe, and no other tribe would mess with them as they were big medicine or something. Supposedly, no one who encountered them lived, and the people who did died soon after passing along their stories, and the Indians would go out of their way to avoid the entire area. Then he pointed off in the distance and said, Those mountains right there are the Pedro Mountains, and that's where they live. I figure my old man is screwing with us, but I went to bed with poison arrow mountain pygmies running around my dreams. Sometime years later, the subject came up and my pop went to his bookshelf, which was more of a library as he was somewhat of a historian, pulled out a book and handed it to me. Story goes that some guys were blasting a mine shaft into the side of the mountain and found a mummy inside the mountain. Some people who analyzed this said, it was in his 60s at the time of death. Others said it was a toddler. The mummy changed hands numerous times, and no one knows where it is now, and bad things reportedly befell all those who were in possession of it. When I read the chapter about it and saw the pic years later, my blood ran cold. I guess my dad wasn't screwing with us after all when he told us that story so many years ago. Next story. My hunting buddy and I secured permission to hunt from Mr. Smith. Not his real name, of course. He owned several hundred acres that were full of turkey and whitetail. We were hunting deer. The morning we arrived, he was in front of his home and we spoke to him, thanked him again, and asked if he knew of any hot spots for big bucks. He told us what he'd seen recently, and we went to hunt. The main path to the woods started right behind his house and winded through a field to the woods. My buddy and I hunted all day with no luck. We saw a few does, but we were hunting wall hangers. We took a different path to the house on the way back through that field. About halfway through the field, we came up on this huge hole in the ground. at a smooth size like a well, but was probably 10 inches across and really deep. Just how deep, we never knew. It was surrounded by little posts, what we call flagging tape or surveyor's tape. It was faded, hanging in places. My friend and I stood by the hole and tried to figure out what it was. It was too big for a well, and no mine goes straight down. As we spoke, my buddy took a rock and threw it into the hole. We listened for a splash. Not a sound was heard. He looked at me, and I thought of getting a bigger rock, so I found the rock about two or three pounds and let it fly. We listened for several seconds, and no sound of it landing. We tried to figure out how deep it was by counting the seconds and trying to remember how fast things fall. Neither of us was really good with math, so we never figured out anything but real deep. As we started to leave, my buddy sees this old straight shift transmission laying in the weeds. It's two and a half feet long and weighs maybe 40 or 50 pounds, he said. This will make a noise when it lands. And then he heaves it into the hole. We listened and listened. All of a sudden we hear this god-awful scream coming from the weeds. Before we can think, 
This crazy goat comes out of the weeds straight for us. Now, I have seen a lot of animals before, but this goat had bulging eyes. His tongue is hanging out and swollen, and he's screaming this horrible noise. Snot flying from its nose, and it's coming straight for us. I had no time to do anything but dive to the side. My friend dove in the other direction, and the crazed goat went between us and straight into the hole. His scream slowly dying out over several seconds. I looked at my friend and said, let's go home. He agreed and we headed for the truck. As we got to my truck, the landowners came. He asked us if we had any luck and we told him no. And asked about the big hole. He said he found it after buying the land and marked it so no one would fall in. He said he kept trying to figure out how deep it was. My friend gave me a funny look because I had not mentioned the goat. I thought the guy might think we were nuts, but I reluctantly told the story. He said he'd never seen anything like that before and knew it was not his goat as it was tied up to an old transmission out back. Next story. Back in January of 1992, I was sleeping in since I was off of work that day and at approximately a little bit after 8 a.m., it felt like I was lifted a foot off my bed and dropped. I sat up and looked at the clock. I don't remember actually hearing something, but more or less felt like a loud noise had awakened me. I went to my brother's room across the hall to ask if he'd heard anything. As it turned out, he'd committed suicide, shooting himself in the head with his revolver. In the weeks after the funeral, I would be alone in the house. Sometimes I would sit at the kitchen table because it was the furthest place in the house from his room, and I would break down into uncontrollable sobbing. I felt as though I was at my emotional limit. One morning, as this was happening, I actually felt a presence. It was in the foyer by the front door. It would be in direct visual contact with me if I turned around. I was embarrassed. I thought someone in the family had walked in. I turned in the chair and nothing was there, and the presence was gone. I didn't think much of it. This happened several times. I began to think maybe it was my brother's ghost or spirit or whatever. As long as I did not turn around, the presence would remain. And in time, I could sense it would move towards me. It was an icy, dark, hopeless feeling. Personified, if you will. As it got closer, the fear inside me would grow until I couldn't stand it anymore. Then I would turn around, expecting to see something, but it would be gone. Finally, I decided it was some sort of spirit of suicide. I don't know how I knew that. It was just known. As more of these incidents happened, I began to think that maybe I was just going crazy. I mean, finding my brother with his head half blown off was very traumatic. The grief was like nothing I had ever experienced. I felt I was stretched to my emotional and psychological limit. So it would be logical that I was creating some sort of episode in my mind in an attempt to deal with my brother's death. I decided if I was going crazy, I might as well see what happened if I didn't turn around the next time. There were a few more times, but I couldn't stand the presence of absolute fear, and I would turn around. But now, it got closer. The closer it got, the less easy it was to send it on its way. The last incident, it was almost speaking to me. Not audibly, but there was a weird, seducing soothingness. This last time, it was like I was mesmerized. I sensed it standing behind me, and in my mind, I could see it draped something like a black cloth, over my head. Instantly, I was having the craziest, most suicidal thoughts. I couldn't tell if it was me thinking it or this presence. The thought would flash through my mind that it should have been me, not Tim. Another thought would flash through that you should have taken me, not him, like a trade. I have absolutely no recollection of walking the entire length of our house to go to my bedroom, but next thing I knew, I was sitting on my bed with my 1911 in my hand. It was like I was stoned or drunk or something. Something had me in its power and it was drawing me towards suicide, like a tractor beam on a sci-fi movie. In my heart, I could hear myself saying, no, no, no. Then the thought was Tim was only as far away as the hammer and the firing pin. Then the phone by my bed rang. I was sitting less than two or three feet from it, but it sounded like it was far away. The presence wanted me to ignore it. It rang again. I needed to answer the phone, but ignored it. Finally, I reached the phone, picked it up. It was my mother calling from her work. She asked if I was all right. Instantly, the spell was broken and the presence was gone, but I was drained, like energy had somehow been zapped from me. I told my mom I was fine, and she said she suddenly had the strangest sensation 
that I was in danger. No, I insisted, I'm fine, and we hung up. Even though the presence was gone, there was a lingering, evil feeling in the room. I called my friend and told him what had happened. I asked him to come over and remove all the firearms from our house and keep them until some time when things got better. I still wasn't sure I wasn't crazy, but how do I explain my mother calling? Here's what I've come to believe. I believe there are evil spirits, demonic spirits, and angelic spirits. I would not be surprised if they specialize in certain aspects of ministry or torment slash temptation, whichever may be the case. I would not be surprised if my brother was in a weakened state where he was susceptible to the influence of this demonic spirit. Well, there it is, my scary story. Next story. I was hiking on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia when I was 15. This was uh, around 1990 and was two days into the woods. I slept in the trail shelter that night and the next day I had a creepy feeling all day like someone was following me. So about 1 p.m. I came around a bend in the trail and there's a post note nailed to a tree saying about three or four days earlier a female solo hiker had been violently raped and assaulted in the shelter I had stayed at the night before and gave a rough description of the assailant contact information for police and things like that. It said they had not caught the guy and he was believed to be a drifter slash hobo type who was still in the area. So there I am, two days walk from the nearest road, at least the nearest I knew of how to get on, without bushwhacking through steep and rough terrain. Only weapon I had was a knife and I'm not a very big guy, average size and young at the time. I was freaking out. So it was like a 30 trail miles to a road, a town actually Damascus, Virginia. I walked with a full pack the whole way through the night with a flashlight to make it to the town sometime the next morning. We lived pretty close, so it was easy for my dad to come and pick me up, but I was pretty shaken being that far out in the woods with no real way to defend myself. Now I'm 33, a combat vet with a lot of other sketchy experiences in life. Not a coward by any means, and fairly street smart. And to this day, if I was to run into a similar situation, I would not stick around to test my luck. I think I did the smart thing, getting out of those woods when I did. Next story. It was out in the outskirts of Bardstown, Kentucky, about 50 or 60 years ago. My great uncle and some other relatives who were kids at the time were hanging out way later than they should have been. My Uncle Shorty said they did it a lot when the moon was bright because there weren't many street lights then. One night they were walking home on some dark, dusty road and came around a dark bend. They never thought anything of it and continued. Once leaving the darkness, they heard walking, something that sounded strange behind them. They thought it was a walking tread. At first they figured it was just a horse, but the pace was wrong. It had to be something two-legged. This made them nervous. At night, bad things tend to happen when kids stay out late. So they ran. The steps staggered and began to run. And a few of my cousins looked back and saw a man. What they said to the others was, there's a crazy man chasing us. They kept running and it seemed like forever before they were able to stop and hide in some bushes. And then finally it came to a clearing where a bourbon storage buildings were off the road. The creature, because that's what they called it, was about 50 or 75 yards off from where they were hiding, slowly walking but seemed to be in no hurry. This was when they noticed it wasn't normal. The legs was what truly scared them. They thought it was a demon of sorts. Of course, they shouldn't have been out late, they thought. They watched and waited for it to go around abandoned the road and out of hearing range. Then one of them tried to coax the other to make the first move to run home. They began heading up the opposite direction of the road. After taking a scenic route, they were almost home, which was about an eighth of a mile, and they heard laughter behind them, coming from another shaded area they just left. I knew it was a crazy goat man, and ran until they reached home. Once there, they told their father, who went back out to check everything, but there was nothing, no dust, no tracks in the road, and that was the first and the last of the Goatman. I don't know if it was true or not, 
my uncle Shorty, who was the youngest of them all, is convinced that it was indeed an encounter with the goat man. Next story. This happened back in 2001. I was with my cousin on Laurel Summit, scouting a new spots for bear season. We hiked for about 12 hours, taking breaks every so often. We we're about five miles from the logging road, which is about eight miles off Route 30 east of Ligonier. Once we got to a spot, we set up camp, a couple of tarps and a fire. First night, we heard something rustling around our camp, but we brushed it off as possums or whatever. My dog never gave an indication that anything was there. Mind you, she was an eight-year-old beagle, very mild manner, unless she felt she or I was in danger. Next day, we cleared out a few areas near some game trails and did some trout fishing in one of the many streams in the area. On the night of the 6th, that's when it got a little scary. We heard some noises rustling and brush being moved through near the rear of the camp. Then a couple of rocks and twigs were thrown out of frame lean-to we were in. I blamed my cousin for farting because I smelled something like rotting meat, and he said it wasn't him, and I believed him. Jesse, my beagle, was laying on the ground, shaking. She peed herself. She was so frightened. She stared down black bears and coyotes before and been hunting dozens of times. I'd never seen her act like that before. At that moment, I thought something was not right, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. We started to hear grunting coming from about 10 feet or so from behind the lean-to, and we heard two large branches break. They were easily four inches in diameter when we looked at them in the morning. As I reached for my Smith & Wesson 44 mag with HPs, my cousin grabbed my lever action Rossi 44 mag. I fired one shot in the air to scare what I thought was a bear away. Still nothing. A couple more rocks were thrown in our direction. These weren't pebbles either. One was about the size of a softball. We made our lights brighter because the commotion was getting closer. We got out of the front of the open lean-to and we scanned the area with a spotlight but saw nothing due to the thick briars behind the camp. Then we heard some more grunting throughout the night and some more stone throwing at about 4 a.m. But we dozed off and we were awakened by a horrible, low, audible grunt slash howl that came from within our camp. I grabbed my light and my Smith & Wesson 44 mag, shone the light near the other end of the camp, and all I saw was this large, hairy figure that looked straight at me, then took a step towards us. I fired one warning shot to the side of it, and it took off into the thicket. I'm a big guy, about six feet, weighing 330 pounds, and it made me look tiny. I just about pooped on myself. My cousin, who I've never seen cry, not even at his father's funeral, was crying and trembling. I was shaking. As soon as I was able to, I started the fire back up. It was burning really well. Put two more rounds in my 44 and sat there with my light and the 44 till the sun came up. Once the sun came up, we doubled time to the truck. I don't know what we saw in the woods that night, but it really affected me. It was bad enough that I haven't been back in the woods in many, many years, of course, since then. I also even went to therapy for a year after that because I couldn't sleep for the longest time. What we saw that night upright on two legs was at least seven feet tall. Its arms were as thick as my thigh. It had brownish gray hair, looking very matted and deep sunk eyes. I will never get that image out of my head. Even now, thinking about it, my eyes water and I started shaking and I still haven't been back in the woods.